This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Morocco becomes the fourth nation to normalize relations with Israel, while Saudi-Israeli relations take a hit. Plus, the impact of COVID on Christmas in the Holy Land and how to help Christian businesses. And Jews worldwide begin the celebration of Hanukkah, the Festival of Lights. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. In the latest sign of shifting attitudes in the Middle East, Morocco became the fourth Arab country in four months to join the Abraham Accords with Israel. At a candle lighting ceremony at the Western Wall on the first night of Hanukkah, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu thanked President Trump and said the two countries would work quickly to establish full diplomatic ties. We'll also institute direct flights between Morocco and Israel and Israel and Morocco, giving uh, this bridge of peace an even more solid foundation. This will be a very warm peace, the light of peace on this Hanukkah day has never shone brighter than today in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords are a foreign policy achievement for the Trump administration. And while the Trump campaign wages a battle over the presidential election results, former Vice President Joe Biden continues to assemble a foreign policy team. The potential Biden-Harris administration would mark a profound change in its approach to a potentially explosive Middle East. Sunday marked the third anniversary of President Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. To celebrate, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu put Trump's declaration alongside President Harry Truman's recognition of the newly born state of Israel in 1948. These two historic proclamations will never be forgotten. They'll never be forgotten by the Jewish people and by the Jewish state. They will be cherished for generations. However, there are concerns that some of the advances made by the Trump administration could be changed or even reversed. So far, Joe Biden has indicated he would likely keep the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem if he becomes president. But what about other Trump policies in the Middle East? Michael Oren is Israel's former ambassador to the U.S. With respect to Iran, uh, both the former vice president and his running mate, Senator Harris, have said unequivocally that they intend to renew the Iran nuclear deal of 2015. If Iran returns to the levels of uranium enrichment established by that deal, it's not very difficult for Iran to do. And that means lifting sanctions. And that has profound ramifications for Israel in the Middle East. Netanyahu also noted other positive moves made by Trump on Israel's behalf. You recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. You recognize Israel's legitimate rights in Judea and Samaria. You proposed a realistic peace plan that acknowledges those rights and maintains Israel's ability to defend itself. You forged the historic Abraham Accords. Oren believes a Biden administration would not invest in those accords the way the Trump administration has. I don't think they're gonna invest money, for example, in building the Israeli-Sudanese peace because that belongs to the, the Trump era. And again, the emphasis will be on the Palestinian issue and not on the Abraham Accords. On the Palestinian front, Senator Harris has embraced a return to negotiations with the Palestinians and stated, we are committed to a two-state solution and we will oppose any unilateral steps that undermine that goal. That signals opposition to building in the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank and restoring funding to the Palestinian Authority. From Tehran to the West Bank, it's clear a Biden-Harris administration would set a dramatically different course than what President Trump has for the past four years for Israel and the Middle East. Since the first signing of the Abraham Accords between Israel and two Arab states, many speculated Saudi Arabia might soon follow suit. But now there seems to be other factors at play. Just this past week, a Saudi prince unexpectedly blasted Israel during a security conference in Bahrain in a session ironically titled New Security Partnerships in the Middle East. They profess that they want to be friends with Saudi Arabia. And yet, all Israeli governments are the last of the Western colonizing powers of the Middle East. From the time of the Balfour Declaration, they have forcibly evicted the inhabitants of Palestine after the 1948 war 
Israeli Foreign Minister Gabi Ashkenazi spoke by video after the prince. I would like to express my regret on the comments of the Saudi representative, the foreign minister. I don't believe that uh, they reflect the spirit and the changes uh, taking place in the Middle East. The real question then is, does that say that the whole kingdom of Saudi Arabia has an attitude problem, or does it say that this guy has an attitude problem? Former Israeli UN Ambassador Dory Gold also attended that conference, witnessing the prince's accusations. I think he was being used by the highest authorities in Saudi Arabia to put some distance between us and them. Gold tells CBN News the attitude toward Israelis appeared very warm, except for the prince. Gold believes Saudi Arabia could still come around, mainly because they have a common enemy. I think it's the Iranian factor which gave birth to the Israeli-Arab peace process as we know it today. Danny Danone, another former UN ambassador, tells CBN News he believes the Saudis will eventually join the Abraham Accords. They are the most important one for the region, for Israel, and they understand that once they will normalize the relation with Israel, we will see much more stability in the region. And it will be a, a major force to block the hostility coming from Iran. Gold points to Washington as being the major part of this puzzle. And what happens next? If they hear from Washington, we like the Abraham Accords, we want more treaties between Israel and its neighbors, great. Gold says while the Trump administration has improved the connection between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which led to opening its airspace to Israeli planes, it could all change if a Biden administration were to take a different approach. But if, on the other hand, they uh, don't acknowledge that, they say, no, you want to improve the Middle East environment, you know, give the Palestinians more money and make the Palestinians the center of everything, that will not move us very far along. You saw Danny Danone, Israel's former ambassador to the UN, comment on Saudi Arabia. We also talked with Ambassador Danone in our studio about an upcoming conference bringing together Israeli innovation and world leaders called Diplotech Global Summit. Okay, Ambassador Danone, thanks for joining us. Tell us about this uh, Diplotech Global Summit you have in just a few days. Thank you for having me. Indeed, we are really excited about Diplotech 2020. For the first time, we will bring uh, world leaders diplomats to meet Israeli entrepreneurs and to speak about life post-COVID. We know that Israel is a startup nation, and now we have to discuss what Israel can do to support other countries, mainly developing countries, with our technologies. We will hear from experts, from leaders like Ambassador Nikki Haley and many other dignitaries. Can you tell us what some of those Israeli innovations are? We will have a technology that deals with the post-COVID, how can we walk? How can we study uh, with the new reality? And also, we're going to have some uh, interesting developments in the medical field. So it will be a combination for medical experts and also about daily life, what we can do to help our children to stay connected to school remotely. We know it's very challenging. And what we can do with, in terms of workplaces, we will hear from experts and we also we will see new Israeli startups that are dealing with those issues. Can you tell us who's going to be participating in this conference? It's a unique uh, mixture of uh, friends of Israel who value our friendship and also understand that uh, we are here to support them, to help them. And uh, we see when we cooperate with many countries, we see the support in the international arena. In Honduras, for example, so we expect that by the end of the year, Honduras will announce that they are moving their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and we appreciate that. And that's what I believe. I believe that when we invest and when we build bridges, eventually it supports the diplomatic relations we have with more than 160 countries worldwide. In general, what's your view of the Abraham Accords, Ambassador? Uh, we think it is a great uh, initiative. Uh, I think it deeper than the relation we have with Egypt and Jordan. It's not only treaties between leaders, it's peace between people. So many Israelis uh, visiting the Gulf, uh, and I think we can achieve a lot together. And also in our summit, Diplotech 2020, we will have speakers and guests from the Gulf. Yeah, is that one of the, uh, the goals of the, uh, the summit, to be able to incorporate uh, this new relationship with these Gulf countries? Absolutely. And there's a lot of interest from their side about our technology. It's a win-win. I have been there in the past when it wasn't so easy for Israelis to visit the, the UAE. And I can tell you that they really have admiration for our technology and we have admiration 
for their entrepreneurship. And I think together we can achieve a lot. I invite uh, the friends of Israel, uh, Jews, Christians, uh, Muslims, everybody who support Israel to join us for Diplotech uh, 2020 and to become partners uh, in building the future together. Well, Ambassador General, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it very much. Up next, what impact COVID has had on Christian businesses in the Holy Land? How you can help. In a few days, Christians around the world will celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But it's a very different Christmas season in the place where it all began 2,000 years ago. Normally at this time of year, Manger Square here in the heart of Bethlehem and next to the Church of the Nativity would be filled with tourists and Christian pilgrims. But in the town where Jesus Christ was born, it's much different during the year of COVID. There's going to be no celebrations. Um, there can be no uh, 24th, uh, the normal year that you have covered every year, the parades and Boy Scouts and music in the streets and everything. Bethlehem this year is a tourist town without tourists. Since COVID started in March, the tourists go out from Bethlehem. Until now, we don't see any other tourists. The situation here is very sad. No tourists at all. People are sitting at home waiting to open a new page when this disaster will be finished. Christian artisans here in the Bethlehem Star Olivewood factory have certainly felt the impact. I am suffering here also in my, in my factory. You see that I have here 14, 15 people works in my factory. I did not send any of my people home. I left them here. All of them are working in the factory just at least to get uh, some income in the end of the week. That's where Arts a Box comes in, a Jewish company designed to bring the Holy Land to Christians in North America. Israel has such strong significance to so many people, so many different faiths, but about 95% of Christians in, in North America, uh, for example, never actually make it over into Israel. And we spend our lives learning the Old Testament, the New Testament, all the stories and the people and the characters and also the life of Jesus. You have no way to actually bring these stories to life. An Arts a Box subscription provides gifts from the Holy Land four times a year, made locally by folks like Jamil Hosh. Last quarter featured Nazareth, and this quarter, Bethlehem. It's their way of bringing the Bible to life. That, coupled with uh, COVID, which hit earlier this year, um, and all these small businesses and artisans are really suffering because they really rely on tourism. So we decided to create Arta, which delivers the experience of Israel to your doorstep and takes you on a journey through the land. And at the same time, we help support all these small businesses and artisans and, you know, these incredibly talented people, especially now when, you know, their tourism isn't coming here. That includes Jamil Hosh, his family and factory. Arza, I make him two big orders and now they are selling my products in the United States. They help me a lot. Maybe I work about six or seven weeks in summertime to Arza orders. It was very helpful. And still in the beginning, I am expecting next year to be more orders from Arza and to work with more items. In Jerusalem, just a few miles from Bethlehem, COVID also hit Christian businesses. Many of these alleys would be filled with tourists, but now many of these shops in the Christian quarter of the old city are shuttered and closed. Local uh, business it went down to zero. Just like all, one day, boom, it has been very difficult. And as I have many people who also work with me in this business, and it has been very difficult for them. Zach Mishriki is a third-generation Christian shopkeeper in Jerusalem's old city. Since COVID started, I had a challenge, you know, what, what is next? And as soon as COVID started, I started investing online. I sell many Christian items that was produced here in Jerusalem to bless the whole world and make them closer to God. From olive wood nativity sets to coins from the time of Jesus and anointing oil, Mishriki offers a wide range of Christmas gifts. He feels it's important for Christians around the world to support their brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. Christians in the Middle East, and especially in the Holy Land, now we're only 1% of the population here, and uh, supporting them is supporting the Holy Land. Supporting them is supporting, you know, the existence of Christ here. Shemel sees his efforts through Arts of Box as a way to fulfill the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, healing the world. We're not just here to help Jews, we're here to connect and, and help everyone with the world regardless of their faith. You know, that's a very Jewish value, which I think is very important. And secondly, you know, the Christian support for Israel and their connection to Israel is just overwhelming and incredible. So if there's a way on a personal level to give back to that, then I think that's very important as well. 
Both Art to Box and Zach's online store want to provide a meaningful Christmas. Buying, you know, gifts that is, has meanings, you know, and made by Christians on the land, you know, uh, and they really support families in the, in the land. We want to bless them back. We really hope that it brings people a lot of Christmas joy and, you know, to celebrate your Christmas with Christmas ornaments from Bethlehem made from olive wood as well. And, you know, from all these beautiful products from the area, you know, which is the story of Christmas. Uh, we think people really enjoy it and, and we hope people really do. Coming up, Jews worldwide celebrate Hanukkah, the festival of lights and a miracle more than 2,000 years ago. For eight days, Jewish people around the world celebrate Hanukkah holiday marking a great victory more than 2,000 years ago. This year, things will be a bit different due to COVID, but we'd like to show you what Hanukkah looks like in a non-COVID year. Thousands of Israelis come to Jerusalem's old city at Hanukkah to celebrate and see the lights. All over the world, Jews say special prayers, thanking God for miracles past and present, and light a special candelabra or menorah called a Hanukkah for eight days. This is a holiday about spirituality. This is a holiday about um, values. This is a holiday about connecting to God. So many Israelis come here. Everybody's attracted to the light. Also known as the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah is not mentioned in the Old Testament, but it is in the New Testament. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. CBN News joined Rebecca Spiro and her family for the Jewish celebration. It's a holiday that celebrates religious freedom and our victory against oppression and our ability to rededicate the temple. In the second century BC, the Jewish people in Judea revolted against the Syrian Greek conquerors. The Seleucids tried to impose their culture, forcing the Jews to eat pork and forbidding Sabbath observance, Torah reading and circumcision. Worse still, the Seleucids defiled the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and dedicated it to the Greek god Zeus. Led by a priestly family known as the Maccabees, the Jewish people retook Jerusalem and rededicated the temple. But when they wanted to light the menorah, there was only a tiny bit of sacred olive oil left. We celebrate the eight days that the menorah burned, which is miracle. It was beyond nature and also the um, military victory. Eating fried foods like potato pancakes and jelly donuts is another Hanukkah tradition. Spiro's family and neighbors also have their own personal tradition to build unity between secular and religious Israelis. Every single year we bring out a table of drinks and thousands of people come to the old city for Hanukkah to look around and see the menorahs and the uh, light. Spiro says there's a message in the holiday for today. No matter what happens, our candles burn bright and like uh, civilizations have come and gone, but the Jewish people are still here. Still ahead, reading the Bible in the land of the Bible. The story of Mary from the book of Luke. Last week, we brought you a new segment we call Reading the Bible in the Land of the Bible. We began in the book of Luke, chapter 1. Here's more from that chapter. Take a look. The Gospel according to Luke. And the people waited for Zecharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. 
Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One, who is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We hope you enjoyed reading the Bible in the land of the Bible. We filmed that in the Judean wilderness, not far from Jerusalem. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And for all our Jewish friends, Happy Hanukkah and Hak I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.